recorded. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. Thank you for joining tonight's Shir with Coach Menachem Berfeld. And tonight is Shir 180. Rip Simon, 180 Shir, and we did so far. Beautiful. Beautiful, yep, yep. Shimon was on uh, about three years ago. I'm Baruch Hashem to have him again tonight. First, a thank you to all the people that uh, come every week and a machazik and help this platform grow and tell people about it, their friends, and they post it on their statuses, they email friends. As we say, it's a, it's a very much place to talk through in Yonim, especially things that we're dealing with in today's days and generations. We've dealt with a lot in the past four years. So thank you for joining. Again, if anybody has, wants to join our WhatsApp chats, you can WhatsApp me at 732 732- 314-1710 and uh, I'll send you the community chat. I'll also post it in the in the in the in the chat box. So we'll also send that on email. And Menachem, you can go to menachembernfeld.com, go to his website, you can sign up for his emails. He sends out the flyers and the replays every week and all the important things that are happening on Coach Menachem Planet. Uh for anybody who's watching this video on YouTube, you can click on the like button, subscribe button, when Menachem uploads the Shiram, you get not about you're notified about it, and you get to watch all the past 179 Shiram Metchem this year as well. Special thank you to all the advertising sponsors, the Lakewood Scoop, Ellie and Ariel from, from Five Town Central, Kyla Kaufman from JCN, and Mika Sofer from COL Live. We appreciate posting it and getting this share out. Again, anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on the Zoom ID, we have different shear and different topics, different therapists, different abonim, many interesting people in Klai Yisrael to come to talk about important things. And we'll next week, April 7th, we're going to have a deep discussion with David Goldwasser discussing how to get ready this year for Pesach. We're going to work through the, the topic to really get the island ready for it. It's going to be a powerful uh, program. Please join us. Rabbi David was also with us, uh, I think, once or twice before, and he's amazing. And we're going to start off first with Coach Menachem. Coach Menachem, it's a Sunday night. The island's busy. What are we doing here? What's tonight's program all about? Yes, welcome, everyone, to another Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem. Baruch Hashem, we're doing number 180. With a lot of siyata deshmaya, and it's chus to have Rabbi Jacobson back. We had him a while ago. It was before Shoshana many years ago, and here we are before Pesach to get ready a little bit. I hope everyone had a nice Purim, uh, meaningful, uplifting Purim. And now we're in between Purim and Pesach. Between Purim and Pesach is a is a big big time, especially Chaydish Nissen. It's uh, the things are things are different. You can smell it in the air. You can feel it at home. It's uh, you know the the energy. Everybody in their own situation. And the frat today is today's days in in the world of what's going on. The situation by like Klal Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael in the whole world. It's a man of Gula, and uh, we've been waiting for the Gula for many years. And it's uh, something something to talk about. What does it mean? How do we connect to it? What do we do? And especially in today's days, you call yourselves an ace tzara. And uh, let's hope it's connected to the gula, you know. But how? What do we do? You know, it's there's many, there are many questions of how to connect to it, how to understand it. Should we move to Eretz Yisrael? To, you know, or everybody with their own things. Many in Israel are thinking of moving back so that they don't have to get drafted. But Miadeya, you know, wherever we are, we have to connect to Hashem and to understand that there's something behind all of this and the bigger picture to wait for the Gula. And Nissan is this man. So before Pesach, how to connect with with the Gula and also with Emun and Betachen. Connecting with Amun and Betachen, Pesach is a time which Klal Yisrael became a nation. And, uh, you know, many of us, we, in a way, we take for granted. We're used to it. We live it. We do the things every day. But uh, stop for a moment. And every year, yes, every year, the Yom Tovim come, Pesach comes again. We do the... We do the action, but to connect to it, to understand the deeper meaning, to connect to the Amunah, to the betachen to understand a little bit deeper, and like I said, especially today's days, we need it. Um, it's a it's a zman that we're not sure. There's a lot of uncertainty, and we're all hoping for the gula mitzvah Hashem, but how to connect to it? So Baruch Hashem, we have this chus, have Rabbi Jacobson back with us, and I think we can talk about whatever comes up, whatever. You know, whatever's on your mind. 
Now is the time. And let's have a discussion in Mitzvah with a lot of Siyat HaDishmayash. Go ahead. Beautiful opening. Thank you for opening it up. Again, we're going to start off tonight's shir is, we, we wrote it up as Gaza and Mitzrayim, spiritual and historical roots of today's war, offering trans, transformative and personal global lessons, what we could learn from what's going on in the world and in the history and putting it together. We have this chosar of Simon Jacobson here tonight with us. Rabbi Simon Jacobson Jacob is a pioneering speaker, educator, mentor to thousands. He's the author of the best-selling book, Towards a Meaningful Life, a William Morrow publication that sold over 400,000 copies to date and has translated into Hebrew, English, French, Spanish, Deutsch, Portuguese, Ita Italian, Russian, German, Hungarian, Polish, Czechs, 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 whatever. I don't know if it's a country anymore. Georgian and Croatian. Rabbi Jacobson heads the Meaningful Life Center called Spiritual Star. It's called a Spiritual Starbucks by the New York Times, which bridges the secular and spiritual throughout a wide variety of live online program present the universal teaching of Torah as a blueprint for life for, for to people of all backgrounds. With his keen insight into human condition, he has the ability to offer clarity and direction, especially in difficult times. Of Jacobson and the M M MLC, which stands for the Meaningful Life Center, has, has lauded for creating a nonstop programming, nourishing people's hearts and souls. His website, again, is MeaningfulLifeCenter.com. You can check it out. Again, it's supposed to have him. Rabbi Jacobson, the floor is yours. Okay. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, Shalom Aleichem to everyone. And uh, indeed, we are in a very special time. Uh, the Gemara says, especially regarding a, a year like this, which is a leap year, that uh, Purim is in the second month of Adar, because Mismach Geula Le Geula. Because usually you'd think that Purim would come in the first Adar, because the second Adar is the additional one that's only added every year in the leap years. And yet because we wanted to be Misemach, to, uh, to make it consecutive, going from one Geula straight into the other, from Purim to Pesach, so we're mamish in that period of time. So we have a special energy, redemptive energy, you can call it, to help us get through any challenge and to find Geula, whether it's Geula Pratis, on a microcosmic level or on a macrocosmic level. Um, so yes, indeed, our hearts and souls, you know, it's, it is a challenging time. We have, as we speak right now, Eden, our and Sakona in danger, and when we say Eden are in danger, even though it's 7,000 miles away from us here in the United States or other parts of the world, but we're one people. And if one Jew is hurt, we're all hurt. And if one Jew is, is strong, we're all strong. So we're in this together. And, uh, and it's not business as usual. I think it's critical to understand that. The Rambam writes in the beginning of Hilchus Tainius, when he explains the reason we fast, he says because when a, a, a catastrophe or a negative thing happens to an individual or to a community, it would be achzorius, it would be insensitive and cruel to call it mikra nikris, a coincidence, just random. It means it's a wake-up call for us to become more introspective, more soul-searching. It's, 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 everything that happens is for a reason. The fact that we're here today in this world, wherever we may be, and there's challenges that the Jewish people face, both in Eretz Yisrael, and we also know the anti-Semitism and all the other things that are going on, so it's not a time to be complacent and sit back on our laurels, but actually a time of a, of a, 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 say to us, a wake up call, and, uh, and this is primarily the reason I felt that as soon as you invited me on, absolutely every opportunity we have that we can inspire each other and strengthen each other, this is the time. I have no doubt in my mind that this event, the events that happening since uh, Shmini Yatser, Asim Chesteta this year, which uh, the world calls October 7th, is probably going to be the defining event of our lives. Um, such a, first of all, the atrocities and the brutality has already been pointed out that since the Holocaust, such attack in one day on Jewish people and the ongoing, now the truth is, we know the enemy was there before. And uh, it's just that now it's become very obvious. In many ways, many of our adversaries are coming out of the woodwork and they're revealing their true face when you hear their statements and their attitudes and so on. So 
I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to realize, you know, we are here long before all our enemies were here, and we're here after they've all gone a long time ago. And we're going to say soon, Pesach, by the night, we all know what it says, not one, but and I don't even want to repeat it right now, but in every generation we had, our enemies stood up to try to, in some ways, hurt us or annihilate us, chalisenu, and but we always had that Kaddish Baruch Hu Matzilenu Miyodam, and this is not a theory. It's not just based on faith. It's based on facts. You go through our history, starting from Mitzrayim, Golis Mitzrayim, and then Geula, the Yitzis Mitzrayim, story of Purim, of course, and over and between, literally every empire, whether it was the Egyptians and then the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans and the Ottoman. I mean, literally in every generation, we had one form of either discrimination, expulsions, genocides, and of course the Holocaust itself just in our past generation. And yet, here we are to talk about it. How many obituaries have been written for the Jewish people? Because statistically, it didn't make sense that the Jews would continue to prevail. Here is a, a, a people that's barely 15 million strong. 15 million among 8 billion. You know, so when it says, Kiv Sa'achos ben Shivim Ze'evim, it's literally that way. One sheep, one lamb among 70 wolves, and we are the fewest among all nations, and yet we have we are here close to four thousand years from the time of Avram Avinu. The Romans are long gone. The Egyptians are long gone. The Assyrians are long gone. The Babylonians are long gone. The Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the you name it, all gone. Even though they had greater empires, greater armies, more money, land, people, and so on, and Every Jew knows this in our heart, that there's something about the, the Klal Yisrael and Am Yisrael. In the Lashon of the, in the Pesach, he says, Ani Hashem leishanisi, just as God is immutable, leishanisi, ubnei Yisrael leichalisam. From the word chalisenu, that the Eden leichalisam. It's impossible to eliminate them because they come from the same Nitzchias as from Hashem himself. So though we come, we've been wounded and we've been hurt, and yes, We've had we incurred many, many losses, but there's something in Nitzchi, the Am Yisrael Chai, that lives on and will always live on. So that's number one that we have to always know. But there's much more to it because these stories, these events that happened, and that's why we named it Mitzrayim and Gaza, or Gaza and Mitzrayim, are not just um, to remind us, but they actually, actually offer us tremendous lessons in in our personal lives. And I'll just share, just just as the, an opening, a few thoughts on that. And I'm not sure the order here, but afterwards, I'm, do you open it up to the to the, to the the Elam for questions or Coach Menachem, you'll ask me, I don't know, whatever, however the, the say the goal. But I'll just share a few immediate thoughts. You know, there's the famous Maimah Chazal that says, Bechol der v'der chayev adam lirus esatzme k'ilu hu yotzum mitzrayim. Same chol der v'der, just like it says, Bechol der v'der and v'hi sh'amda, in every generation, a person is responsible, obligated, chayiv, to envision himself as if he left Mitzrayim. That's what it says. Which is the basis of why we have a Seder Shal Pesach and the Haggadah. We do exactly that. We recreate everything that happened in Mitzrayim. Not only that, that's Pesach. Even every day, we have the mitzvah of, of Zechel Yitzis Mitzrayim, Sechidus Yitzis, in the six remembrances that we say at the end of every day morning prayer, Mitzrayim. Hundreds, hundreds of mitzvahs, hundreds of times a day that we mention Yitzis Mitzrayim. So the obvious klotzkash, you could ask, the obvious question is, what, what is this obsession with leaving Mitzrayim? We left thousands of years ago, to be exact, 3,330, uh, um, uh, I think it is 36 years ago, when we left Mitzrayim. The year was 2448 in the Hebrew calendar from, from Bria Se'elam. Why are we still trying to, why, are we, why do we need to remember? And more importantly, what do you mean envisioning? 
Most of us have never been to Egypt, Mitzrayim. According to some opinions, you're not even allowed to go to Mitzrayim. So what is? Why do we have to envision as we are, as as we're go, leaving Mitzrayim? It's more good. We can remember what happened to Avesenu, to our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors. How do you explain that type of reality? That it's like behavior, like it's happening right now. So one of the explanations the Medrash says, "Kol agolius nikru al shem Mitzrayim." All the Goliaths, every form of exile, every form of displacement, I'm going to dis- explain that in a moment, is called on the name of Mitzrayim. Why? Because Mitzrayim means Shemihei Mitzides li Yisrael. Mitzides means they create, they, they create uh, um, oppre- they oppress the Jewish people. The word Mitzar. Mitzrayim comes from the word Mitzar. A type of um, oppression, affliction, pressure, so every Golas has one thing in common, that something, some, there's some oppressor that is in some way trying to hurt us. It could be Begashmis, it could be Beruchnis, physically, spiritually. Haman, same idea. He wanted to annihilate Anoshim, Noshim Vitaf, all men, women, and all Jewish men, women, and children. It's a form of Mitzrayim. So in other words, Mitzrayim is a central, you can say, the archetype of every form of pain and hurt every form of duress. Now, if you take it a step, deeper step, it says in, in Sifre Kabbalah, Sifre Chassidus, that Mitzrayim comes from the word Mitzrayim V'gvulim. It refers to the psychological and emotional and spiritual constraints that all of us experience. Every form of fear, every inhibition, every insecurity, every trauma can all go under the rubric of the general name Mitzrayim. So Mitzrayim, yes, was a land called Egypt where we were in Golas, we were slaves in Avodim Ayinu, we were servant slaves in Mitzrayim. But Mitzrayim is not just a thing that happened then. In every generation, in every moment of our lives, we all have a form of Mitzrayim. So really, when we look at, at Golas Mitzrayim, it says Mitzrayim, we should be looking, this is the prototype that is a, a essentially captures, encapsulates every form of oppression. So you can basically look at it this way. Every time you have anything in your life that you feel constrained by, that's limiting you, that you feel afraid of, that concerns you, is essentially the Mitzrayim in your life. And the Torah is telling us that b'chol every day in every generation, and in some places it has b'chol yem v'yem, and every day we have to recreate that experience of Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim to know that you always have the power, no matter what is constraining you, whatever is limiting you, whatever is oppressing you, whatever is distressing you, distress, whatever dire straits you may be in, you have the power of Anechi Hashem Alekecha Hashem Mitzrayim, which also explains the beginning of the Aseret Sadibris. It doesn't say Anechi Hashem Alekecha that created heaven and earth, because God created heaven and earth unbelievable, but something even greater. Hashem gave us the power to get out of our limitations. So nothing is impossible. So if you want to know what is the secret of the Jewish people being here, because they always had Yitzhak Mitzrayim with them. Not just what happened back then, it happens all the time. So we're not just remembering and commemorating events from back then, we're reliving them. And what better moment do we see that in a time like this? So another, another enemy by the name of Hamas, Similar to Haman, and we know Hamas, it's Hamas, Hamas means crime, violence, murder, has risen up and attacked the Jewish people in a horrible way. And we all know we would have been equal victims if we were in, in, in the harm's way. So they weren't targeting one particular, any Jew. So we're literally re experiencing a Mitzrayim of our time. And you don't need to stretch far. It's exactly that. And besides the fact that Gaza, is essentially on the border of Mitzrayim. And we see that happening. But then there's the second half of the story. And the second half of the story is that just like then, just as then, we also now have all the power. And it's coming from Purim, the power to free ourselves and overcome our enemies, both physically and spiritually and psychologically, and that with no question, we will be victorious, just as the Mitzrim, who pursued the Jews, ultimately were completely eliminated, so too will be with our enemies now. 
And more importantly, and for us, for the Eden will be only light and beauty and simcha, like we said in the Megillah. We read in the Megillah, four different expressions. So what we can do is hold on to the fact that's historical precedent, that we had it back then, and the same will be today. So the first thing we take from that is tremendous strength. But we also can learn many lessons. Many, many lessons can be learned from it, which we'll be discussing uh, during this program. I just wanted to lay the, the ground for it to understand that whatever happened then is happening now. It's not just a uh, nice uh, connection. It is actually the same events and the same Hashem and the same challenges, just with a different name. This doesn't minimize the pain that we have. You know, that doesn't minimize it. But it also gives us the total confidence, the unwavering fortitude that we can, we can and will uh, prevail as we've always prevailed. And that when we look back in history, we want to be able to look back at these events, we'll be able to say the same thing like happened by Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We were strong. We taught our children to be strong and never to cower in fear or retreat. And with Hashem's help, just as it was then, we will march out of all the different challenges, in this case, the enemy that wants to hurt us, and march indeed to the Gula Amitis Vashlema. This is just a means of a small introduction, so to speak, to the topic that we're addressing. And, uh, and any question you may have, any, any doubt, any issue, if we can look into the Torah, the Torah is here to tell us, let's look into what the events that happened in, by, by Mitzrayim, and we can apply it exactly to here. I, in the last months, literally done hundreds and hundreds of programs doing exactly that, gleaning and drawing out from different psukim, my Mare Chazal, lessons that we can apply to our lives, which only gives even more strength because you know you're not alone and you know you have, we have an arsenal filled with weapons. One final point I want to make before we continue, and that is that every war has two sides to it. There's the physical war, there's the spiritual war. And in many ways, the spiritual war is even more important than the physical war. Because if you don't have the willpower and the morale and, that, and confidence, you can have all the weapons in the world. You can be the most powerful, but you have to have that ability to be confident. There was a custom in the olden days, certain armies, before they went out to battle, they would sing a song of victory. You didn't even fight a battle yet. Why are you singing a song of victory? Because there's an element of confidence. You know that we shall prevail. The Tur says it about Rosh Hashanah, why we wear white. And Rosh Hashanah, even though we haven't yet stood before the judgment, the, the judge, the Eberster, but because we're even are confident that we will absolutely be victorious and that we did that we will for sure prevail. So when you enter into the picture but beforehand with that confidence, that itself is a critical component in any battle. So that's where we all come in. Some people are fighting the battle literally on the front lines with weapons, and they are in danger. But we all have to feel that we're soldiers in this battle because it's also an information war, a media war, a propaganda war, and a war of morale that we should not feel weak or feel victimized, but we feel strong that we are standing and we're being attacked because we're Jews. And here's, here's an opportunity to create a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, which we see happening, how Eden are coming together. And Halavai, we shouldn't need tragedy to bring us together, and we should be able to carry it over in beautiful times. So there's no question that, uh, that uh, the Purim and Pesach will teach us and will happen in our time as well. With, the, with our own victory, and ultimately the Gula Amitiz Vashlein. Amen. Shkayach Rav Jacobson, beautiful. Okay, we're going to take a two-question poll, and then we're going to jump into questions again. It was Zerchit to have Rabbi Jacobson here with us tonight, and Rabbi Jacobson is here to answer any question you have on any topic, so feel comfortable, and uh, let's take a two-question poll here. Here we go. First question, in your opinion, do you perceive any connection between the ongoing conflict in, in Gaza and historical events in Mitzrayim? Option one, yes, I see a clear historical and spiritual connection. Option two, no, I believe the current conflict is unrelated to historical events in Mitzrayim. Option three, I'm unsure as I need more information to make a connection. Option, that was option three. Option four, I believe there might be some symbolic connections, but no direct cause, causation. 
So those are the four options. Everybody give your opinion. It's okay to vote however you like. The second question, what do you believe we should extract from the war situation? Number one, emphasizing introspection, right? Be'achtos, we should learn to be more be'achtos. Number two, recognizing that we're talking Golis. Or option three, prioritizing teshuva. We should focus, it's time to do teshuva. In your opinion, those are the three things. Can everybody see it? Menachem, you see it? Doesn't look like people are voting. Yes, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna re uh, launch it. Okay. Okay, Menachem, you see it now. Maybe yep. they're just, maybe they're just bashful. Yeah, now it works. No, no, everybody votes. Okay, does everybody see it? First yep. question: Do you perceive any connection between the ongoing conflict in Gaza and the historical events in Mitzrayim? Can we see people voting or no? Okay, because I can't see it on my computer, so you'll, you'll, you'll read it all. Give you five seconds. Okay. Did you read the second one? Second question. What message do you believe you can extract from the war situation? Either more betachen, right? I'm sorry, more beachtos to have more togetherness with our Yidin. That we're direct to, just to, to realize that we're still in Gullahs, that no matter how comfortable you are or wherever you are. Or option three, that it's time to, to rep, prioritize time, it's time to do tshuva. That's the second question. Again, from those three, I mean, okay, Menachem, should we uh, end it and share it? Yeah. You'll read the answers, okay? Mm hmm Okay. Go, Menachem. Question number one. Do you perceive any connection between the ongoing conflict in Gaza and the historical events in Mitzrayim? We have 46% that voted yes. I see clear historical and spiritual connection. 5% no. I believe that current conflict is unrelated. 29% I'm unsure. As any more information, and twenty percent, I believe there might be some symbolic connection, but not direct causation. No, Rabbi Jacobson, the item agrees with you. You laid the foundation. <laughs> I, listen, uh, if everybody agreed, it wouldn't be a good sign. Uh, the Yidden are meant to uh, have different approaches and opinions. Different part of the title. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's an absolute given simply because the Abishta runs the world. And there's a reason we have, when we're celebrating now Purim and we're celebrating Pesach, we're not just celebrating events that happened now more. I mean, I, I would wonder if you put in the poll a question, do you think that Mitzis Mitzrayim is happening now or not? Or it's only an event that happened thousands of years ago. If anyone would answer it's not happening now, then I feel uh, that they're, unfortunately, maybe they weren't taught properly because, like I said, Bechol der v'der chayiv adam liris kilu yotzim in Mitzrayim, today, now. And the whole idea of Teirah is that Teirah is Nitzchi, that all the events in the Teirah are meant to be relived now. So, you could say, it's not exactly, obviously, it's different characters. We don't have, his name is not Pari, and the, and the Hamas are not called Mitzrayim, but that we should be able to relate to the ideas. When we say, Vehisha Amdalon, is anyone going to say, that the Chol Der Veder Eimdim Aleinu is not including what happened now. I don't think anyone would. Uh, I think uh, so. So I'm not. I'm not challenging anyone's a position about the poll. But I think if you think a little deeper into it, you realize yes, all these events. Bechol Der Veder Eimdim Aleinu L'Chalasene. That's not my words. That's the words of Chazal. That's something that we all say in the Haggadah. And when your children ask you, what does that mean? Today, we don't even need any explanation. We just look at what's happening. And when you see an attack like Mona Lislan on Eden anywhere in the world, and you see that there's still anti-Semitism, all this is reliving what happened. So, um, um, but it's good to hear people's uh, thoughts. Uh, you know, to me, it's always, you always learn, it's always illuminating. And uh, maybe it's our job is to help explain these ideas in ways. And I would, I would definitely feel that it'll help bring alive the Haggadah and Pesach events, and including what we're coming from, put him already. Um, you know, there's a word from the Rizal 
which says Hayomim Ha'el and Iskodim Venasim that we said in the Megillah. And he asks, what means Venasim? Why is it not just Hayomim Ha'el and Iskodim? Because we don't just remember, we actually recreate. Whatever happened then is happening now. Your birthday, when you celebrate your birthday, you're not just celebrating a birthday that happened when you were born. Every year on the day of your birthday, all the events, time in Judaism like a spiral, they all come back to that moment as you when you were born. The same thing with Rosh Hashanah, the same thing with Yom Kippur, and the same thing with every significant date. In Teda, in Yiddishkeit, these days have a certain energy that returns when we come back to that moment. So it's all happening, Dibar HaKosav behavior. it's all happening now and today. That's going to be the discussion tonight, to Mitzvah Shem, to get people to connect it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and remember, the key is to make Teda kol b'chol yeim v'yeim yeh b'necha chadoshim, as Rashi brings a number of times from the from Medrash. Every day, we have to consider the Teda as if it's happening right now, which frankly is the ultimate solution to making Teda very relevant and personal and alive. For many people, Teda is okay. I'm remembering, I'm honoring something that happened once. And that has to be relevant to us right now in our immediate lives. Here's the next question. What message do you believe we should extract from the war situation? 46% emphasizing introspection, the Ahdos to be together. 26% recognizing our state of exile, Golos. And 28% prioritizing repentance, Chuva. And uh, something to talk about. Well, listen, they're all correct. I think that uh, there's not one, you know, when you, something happens, like I said from the Rambam, it doesn't say exactly, each one of us has to take a letter. The main thing is that we shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't be complacent. But it's true, Some for some people it's a call to tshuva. For some people it's a call to uh, action. It could be a, 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 a wake-up call, a call to agdus. Um, so I think all the answers are correct in that sense. And probably even more answers. I would encourage, and not just encourage, I feel it's our responsibility to find exactly that. I mean, the best defense is offense. When our children ask us, what are we supposed to think about all of this? Our answer is, Anon Pauli Yamama Anan. We are day workers. Our job is to bring more, wherever there's more darkness, the job is to bring more light, more mitzvahs, more teda, more tefillah, more tehillim, more ardus. No, that's the key. And if, if every person takes upon themselves something, all those answers are legitimate. So in this case, I would say all the above in this poll and, and more. The most important, as I said, is to personalize and say, what, am I, what should I do tomorrow morning? What should I do now that I haven't done before to add more love, more light, more kedusha? And the more we see hatred coming from the other side, the more we have to be passionate about things that are loving. That's the key. Ardus cannot be overemphasized because Ardus is ultimately, we know when Eden are together, all the brachas. The more united we are, this doesn't mean we have to agree about everything, but the more we love each other, the more united we are, the more the stronger we are, that is the best uh, antidote, the best weapon against our enemies is Ardus. And Avas Yisrael. So, all the above. Okay, let's get into it. We have some live questions. Okay, you're on first. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, something I've been thinking about for a little while now is, do we see anywhere in the Torah, or like as a concept in general, that Hashem loves some people or Hashem loves more than others? Meaning, it seems like a fact that some people experience more pain in their lives than others like some people have more of a challenge than others and let's say even in terms of this war uh, um people who are in israel seem to have gone through really tough times um you know while others seem to like cruise through life or not see such horrible um things and i'm trying to just think like in terms of like the shvatim and just like is there some kind of like hierarchy or something yeah. that Hashem has in general? Okay, very good question. Um, so firstly, let me say this. Um, the Pesach says, Bonim atem 
you, the Jewish people, are children of Hashem. So I think anyone who's a parent, and you don't even have to be a parent to know this, knows as a parent, you love all your children. And uh, a healthy parent does not play favoritism. The children can be different, and you accommodate, and you serve your children based on their needs. Children are different. But as far as love goes, you love all your children. There's no such thing. Even if one child, let's say, has more challenges, actually that may even bring out even more love because you need to compensate. So that's the first thing, that Hashem loves all the Eden, I would say, equally. Are, are there people who merit more love because of their tzitkis? You know, you talk about a tzaddik, someone that is demonstrates a very deep connection. So, of course, the love may be more revealed. But the love for every child is there. And even a child who may, Rahman al wander off, still is God's child. You never lose your children. Even if your child is completely doing something that is not what you're happy with, the child will always be your child. And how much more so with Hashem. Ahafti eschem omer Hashem, says the Pasuk. The Abishra says, I love you. I love every Jew. Now, as far as the fact that some Jews suffer more than others, which is, of course, the age-old question, why good people suffer. As a matter of fact, in some places, it even seems to be suggest that sometimes the people on the highest levels may be the ones that hurt are hurt most. Because in a way, uh, in a way, it's like the person who can take more, Hashem may release his wrath more there. That's why they say some of the biggest tzaddikim who died during the Holocaust. Not, it's not a justification. Let me make that clear. We don't understand Hashem's ways and we're not trying to justify. So there's even the expression, sometimes the one you love most, like, you know, if you have two children and one of the child is a very strong person and the other one is weaker, you're not going to, you're not going, you can, the more vulnerable one, you'll protect more. The one that's stronger, you may be, you may reprimand more. Not because you want to show anger, but because you know they have the kachas to deal with it. I mean, this is a topic of its own that deserves its own discussion. So I wouldn't, I would not look at my point that I want to make is I wouldn't look at how a person's life works out as a reflection of God's love or lack of love. We don't know Hashem's mysterious ways. We don't know why 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 the, the concept of Yusudim that people have suffer. And we definitely don't want to explain and try to justify God's uh, I'm sorry, justify suffering in this lifetime. So it's, this remains the mysteries of life because you'll find unbelievable. Holy people, men and women who suffer terribly. And you wonder why. If they're so special, where's God's love to them? And then sometimes you find the opposite. You find people who, who are really, at least on a surface level, don't seem to deserve such beautiful blessings, and they get tremendous blessings. This goes back to the question why the wicked prosper and the, and the righteous suffer at times. And sometimes it's vice versa. So I would stay away. I would not look at a person's life as a reflection of Hashem's love. Hashem loves everyone. We hope and we pray that that love should be revealed. That we should see it. But go explain. Are we going to say, God forbid, if somebody suffers someone a loss? You know, I was at a shiva call recently, a terrible tragedy. Am I going to say that you suffer the loss because God doesn't like you? Because you did something wrong? We have to stay away from finger pointing and guilt and all of that. There are certain things we need, need to humbly realize that we don't understand um, Hashem's mysterious ways. The, I mean, the, the listener, we did a shir with Rabbi Breitowitz, Tzadik Veraloi, Tzadik Veraloi, Verosh Vatoivloi, and it was a very deep shir, and we really spoke about this in very depth. You should definitely listen to it. It was very, very powerful. Yes, very I good. listened to it. Um, I wonder if I can ask just a follow-up question or kind of like see if the statement is true. Is is it correct to say, is it correct as for a person to say, like to kind of be it like as a purpose for them? Meaning I see, like if a person would say, I see that my life is more challenging than others. And, and therefore that means that my relationship to Hashem is therefore closer or that's just... I, I suggested that before. And generally speaking, there's an expression, that Hashem did not ask us to do something unless we have the strength to do it. 
In other words, with every challenge comes strengths. So often it's true. The people, like, you know, let's say you're a teacher or you're, a, for that matter, a coach. The one that is the, the, the student you have that is more gifted and has more potential, you're going to push more. You're going to challenge them more because you see they have that potential. Someone that's weaker, you're going to have more, uh, a, little more dis- more, a little more compassion. So it is possible to say that if a person sees great challenges in their lives, and difficulties, it means that Hashem gave them special strengths to deal with it. And it is precisely because they have the strength that they have that challenge, because we know you can overcome it. It's like uh, challenging someone because they, they have that potential to deal with it. The, the, so I, overall, look, we have to always understand two things. Hashem is good. Hopefully we see the goodness. The second thing is we don't know Hashem's mysterious ways. So even though it may not look good, it doesn't mean that it isn't good. Sometimes it take, you could see it immediately. Sometimes it takes time. So when you have those two principles in mind, pretty much you can get through anything. I mean, even in, even in secular psychology, you have Viktor Frankl's man's, man's, Man in Search of Meaning, where he says, makes it clear, where he witnessed and demonstrated in real time during the Holocaust that when people have meaning in life, and especially people of faith that connect to that, in some way, they're able to deal with challenges more than someone without that. What does that mean? Not that they suffer less, God forbid. They don't suffer less. They just have more resources. You know, think of it like a good swimmer in, in, in the waters. A good swimmer is not someone that will never have a challenge. The difference between a good swimmer and a bad swimmer is a good swimmer knows how to navigate. So when a storm strikes and the tide is high and the waves come crashing, a good swimmer will have the discipline not to fight the tide, he'll float with, he'll go with the flow. A bad swimmer will fight the tide and drain their strengths and, and God forbid, get into deep, deep danger. So it's about learning how to navigate is the key to everything in life. No one is immune in this world before Mashiach comes to some pain and suffering. We're all going to incur some loss. We pray to Hashem, it should be minimal. But the most important thing we need to always know that Hashem gives us with every challenge Tremendous strengths. So instead of really identifying, since you see someone suffer, oh, that means Hashem loves me so much. I don't know if that's really a consolation and comfort. Some people will say, you know what? I'm a vatan on the love. At least I shouldn't have the challenges. You know, I uh, I forego the love. The Eden actually said that when they came out of it by Mitzrayim. So it says, Avram Avinu Hashem said that you will suffer. And then, then you will leave Mitzrayim, you'll leave Egypt with great treasure. So the Eden said to the Abish, today, what, what, we don't need the treasure. Let us go out of Mitzrayim with it. Why do you, we, you know, we forego the, the, the treasure. So it's not always something you want to... But after the fact, Hashem runs the show. The fact of the matter is, it's very possible. You know, I don't want to... It's, 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 it's hard to repeat this, but there's an expression by some of the Rabbeim, the Chesidish Rabbeim, that said, when the Abish to patched, patched it in Ponim. They talk about the Holocaust and other such events. The greatest leaders of the generation, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shmuel, Kain Godel, all the great ones that we talk about in Yom Kippur, Ela Eskere. So sometimes when Hashem patches, He patches in the face, and the face is the great tzaddikim. Is that a justification? Is it an explanation? But sometimes it's the captain of the ship that takes responsibility. Look, Moshe Rabbeinu was not by the Chet Egel. He was in Shemaim. He was with Hashem. And yet he's the leader of the people. So sometimes the leader takes... The, the so-called, he takes the brunt of the blow, which is yet another explanation given for why sometimes the great people are hurt and suffer because they're, in a sense, taking upon themselves the, the yoke of, what, of, of their people, of their community, of their nation. Okay, Gavaldik. Let's go to the next question. I was waiting for the person to unmute. Can you unmute? I wanted to ask the opposite version of this question. Sure. One second. Okay, we'll go back to her. Okay, hi, Sarah, I'll go to you. I'm here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything like this pay suck, maybe at the Seder, 
we can should we make a little different in some ways maybe to you know honor the you know the people there and I, I know Purim for example was kind of cute that thank god the spirit was high a lot of people dressed up as idf soldiers now i wouldn't exactly recommend that for the seder but the thing is is there anything that i don't know to enhance the seder experience at least while thinking of the people in israel especially the soldiers the hostages it's a very good question my answer would be absolutely yes um look we know there's the halachas the things that are required to do by the seder Mm -hmm. you know, there's all the 15 steps of the Haggadah yeah. and we go through every stage and uh, the, the four cups of uh, wine and the matzah and uh, all the different mitzvahs mm -hmm. we do um, and of course the Sipri we tell the story mm -hmm. now I, I someone who's led many Zdorim I find mm -hmm. that sometimes for people the Seder becomes very mechanical you know okay we go through the motions again and again like lip service mm -hmm. and I've had many people who've asked me they say how many times am I going to do so I think a tremendous way to make the Seder come alive is to personalize it. You know, we say, hey, lach ma'anya, and we invite all those that are in need. It's not just a nice theoretical thing. We could say, we could include when we say, hey, lach ma'anya, at least when we speak about it, when we talk, we can say mm -hmm. that whatever is happening, whatever happened then, what do you need more than v'hishamdalan? So I don't think we need to add new customs or add any Newman mm -hmm. hugging. Everything is there. Remember, the Seder was, is essentially a divine blueprint for getting out of any type of Mitzrayim. That's why I gave the introduction earlier. Every Mitzrayim. So now there's a Mitzrayim going on in Gaza, in Eretz Yisrael, and for that matter, in many Jewish communities that have experienced anti-Semitic attacks and so on. So to say that at the beginning of a Seder and to say to our children and say that everything we're going to be saying here is happening today, and let's keep in our kavana and our intention, our prayers, uh, the people, he mentioned the IDF, for sure, people who are being Mesa Nefesh mm -hmm. to protect the Yiddish people. I mean, there's no greater thing than someone who's giving their life. People who are, unfortunately died to protect someone else. And in general, the Hisham Amdalanu is, I think, it's not, it, 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 it's not more, it, it, it's as relevant as it gets, because you see it literally happening. In other years, you could say, we, where do you see in every generation they're rising up against us? Today, no one can make that statement. When you come to Shvei Hamascha, where you're asking God to, to, to avenge the blood of the innocent. So here again, now we always focus on the positive. So I think the Seder is almost like custom made to experience it in context of what's happening. And most importantly, what we're doing about it. Remember, we are doing the Seder. We are um, reliving it, and we want to make sure that we are bringing our tefillahs and our seder all as part of the strength to give the Jews in Eretz Yisrael, especially and anywhere where the Jews are in need. I mean, I know that during the Holocaust, for example, there were many in many communities when it came Pesach that year, the Rabbonim and the Rabbeim and the leaders made it very clear that this seder we should be thinking very strongly about our brethren in Europe who did not have the opportunity mm -hmm. to to do a say that they were under that type of, under a different, uh, under a Hitler, Yemach Shemay, and the Nazis. That was the party of that, of that time. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's, uh, I think it would be really a, a miss of us. It would be like, a, I, I see it as, as, a, as, as unforgivable if we do not use Pesach to, as an opportunity to be ourselves and everyone to Gaul. I mentioned before that, all mitz, all Goliaths, every challenge in history is called on the name Mitzrayim. So you have a yont of Pesach in the middle of a war. I mean, how more relevant does it get? So the Manishtan Alayla Zeh, today we see the Nishtan, is, it's different. And look, as we know, we do different projects with children. To have the children, I'm sure some of the schools and the Chadarim will, will do kinds of projects. The children should be involved in something creative. I, I remember, I'll just mention this uh, interesting um, there was the there were those that called upon that by the say that in memory of the the six million lost in the Holocaust they should leave an empty chair to remember those mm -hmm. that were lost and it was the Lubavitcher Rebbe that came out then and said why why leave an empty chair on the contrary bring a chair and bring a Jew and invite him to the Seder who may not have gone to Seder so you're not just remembering the vacuum and what was lost you're actually because those Eden that would have been here 
and were tragically taken from us, they would be doing a seder. So find a Jew that would do the seder. In other words, let's just not just remember the negative, but turn it into a positive by adding more light. So that's an example. So I think this year, to show more Ahdus and Avas Yisrael, I mean, every person according to their capacity, I think it's a tremendous opportunity to invite guests, people who you work with, people who may not, may not have a family or may not able to or don't have a Seder, to invite them. This is a tremendous opportunity, a schus, that only shows Hashem that we're united, and that schus, may that bring more brachas to the Indian of Yisrael. Yeah. Okay, Rabbi Jacobs, let's go to the next live question. Sure. Okay, I'm mute now. Hi. Hi. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Rabbi Jacobson, I wanted to ask you, um, basing on the first lady's question about feeling her Kurdish Baruch's love for you if you're having a harder time in life, and I kind of wanted to ask the opposite. I feel so blessed in my life right now. I feel like so many things are going easy and beautiful and I've got a beautiful family and, and just so many positive things. Does that mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't trust me enough with his challenges? Like, am I almost, am I not, am I not worthy enough to feel his challenge? I don't really know how to word it, but maybe you can help me. I, I Rabbi, Jacobson, I Rabbi, Jacobson, Rabbi Jacobson is a joke. A guy goes to a lot of Taurus and Taurus. And every time he goes to Taurus, he goes to speak to his relative and he says, this happened and then my kid's sick and I have no parnasa. So the Rav ever tells him the Abish loves you so much, the Abish loves you so much. The guy tells the, the Rav, enough of the Abish loves me so much, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, I feel like Hashem does love me. I really do. I feel his hug very, very often. But I, I, I'm very happy for you, and Hashem should continue to bless you. And Baruchas, no, no, Chaz V'Sholem. The way I would phrase it, I'll tell you what I think I would suggest to you. First of all, it's very sensitive and humble of you to think of that way, but I think it's absolutely not correct. I mean, I again, why Hashem chose to bless you, I'm sure you have many schusim, many merits, and your family has, and parents and grandparents. But I think what you have to feel is like what Moshe Rabbein, like all people who are blessed. What did Yaakov Avinu, when he was when he came out of from Lovan, and then he was, uh, what did he say? Katenti mikolach sadim. I'm humbled by all the chesodim that you, Hashem, are doing for me. So instead of feeling that, no, God is upset, the contrary, thank you so much, and I have tremendous gratitude. I'm humbled, and I will do whatever I can to show you that I deserve it. And I would look at it more like an opportunity to increase in all your good deeds, because you're getting these blessings. Now, Hashem, you're in Hashem's grace and favor. So you're humbled by it, but the humility is not meant to make you feel inadequate or guilty or what's happening here. On the contrary, you know, it's like when Hashem blesses you with a blessing, the best way to repay is by sharing it with someone. Someone was blessed with more money, gives dukkah. Someone's blessed with more intelligence, share that intelligence, learn with someone. So I would say for all your brachas, I would make a achlot the teva and say to Hashem, listen, you're, you're entrusting me with your blessings. I want to show you that I am going to reciprocate and show you I'm a worthy partner of yours. So the more you help, the more you bless me, the more I will help bless others and bring blessing to others. That would be the approach I would take. In okay, that, thank you. The, I appreciate the, that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go to the next live question. That's Hi. beautiful, by the way. You know, there's an expression, Tzaris Chassidim. You usually hear from people when things are not going well. Beautiful to hear some saying... Things are beautiful, and Hashem should bless everyone, all the listeners here, and everyone with many brachas, and we should then show that we are actually partners with Hashem. Give me more brachas, and I'll do even more for you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Yitzchak Friedman. Thank you guys for an awesome show every week, and um, I'm in Baltimore. Rabbi Simon, I used to go to your class for about four years in the village, and I really miss it a lot, so just thank you for that. Um, you know, I have a very, uh, like a difficult question to answer, may not have an answer. My question is saying, basically, there's two billion Muslims in the world. Let's say there's, you know, one, one and a half billion, and there's two, two billion Christians. And our nation is, you know, I don't want to say a number, but we're, we're small. So we didn't get the clear bracha from, you know, that Avram was told we're going to be large in numbers. I think that means large in our quality. Our quality of people is very, very high. But yeah. to quote, fight this 
social media internet world where in a minute, just to give you a real life scenario, I just got a message. These machshefas are going to be, you know, one of these Israel fairs in Baltimore. They're going to be protesting and all their signs, their rallies, their this to intimidate us. You know, these Israel real estate things like they did in Teaneck. And my question is, it's like, I'm very embarrassed. I have a lot of Christian friends who are always asking me, why does a guy like Schumer, after all Trump did and everything was done for the Jewish people, why do Jews vote Democrat? That's not even my, that was a book written by uh, Pod, Pod Horace, his father back in the day. And that was a long time ago. My bigger question is to you, like, we're only a small segment of people. We have this much power compared to like the whole world. And a lot of our nation isn't even on our side, unfortunately, or they're embarrassed or they're not courageous. So, and I have a second layer to that question, but just one, because it's a hard answer. I don't know what you would answer and look at a situation like Schumer. And again, my Christian friends from Texas and the South, it's embarrassing. They're more supportive of Israel than many Jewish people publicly even. Yeah. So what's the question? I'm not sure what the question well, was. The question is, how do I as an individual, and I don't have a big social media presence, but these people can, you know, get together a thousand evil, you know, people holding flags and, and their masks and this and that in any city, in any town across America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. We've seen these crazy protests everywhere. We don't seem to have that same surge. You know, we can email our congressmen and email our senators, but we don't have that in body nation, in body amount of people that we can just gather together and protest them and go out to them. I see four or five people, and most people are intimidated to go out in front of these crowds, as maybe they should be because they're violent people. So how do we fight today? How how do we fight either? Okay, the I understand. Or, yeah. Yep. A very good question, and uh, a lot of people are frustrated exactly with that question. So let me just suggest a few things. First of all, um, look, whether we have the opportunity to make a gathering you know, like they did in Washington right after the war began, that's a, that's a question I don't know if everybody has the capacity to do that. But I think each one of us in our own small circle, sphere of influence, has to see themselves, and it's a point I've been making a lot in the last few months, that we need to really rise to the occasion and become proactive Jews. Let me explain what I mean. A reactive Jew, a reactive person is you react. Something happens. There's a fire. Okay, you bring a fire extinguisher. A, a proactive means you don't wait. You re, you you proactive. You work in your office, and we know there's a war going on. Maybe on Fridays, you share a thought with everybody, or even every day. You find ways to bring light into your sphere of influence, whether it's five people or 5,000 people, everybody in their own way. Everything makes a difference. It's not about numbers. I think it's just a matter because there's so much going on on the other side that people are saying, just stop killing us. Stop attacking us. That's not enough. We have to say, no, we are not just anti-anti-Semitism. We're not just anti-darkness, anti-discrimination. We as a Jewish people came to bring godliness to this world. We pray, came to bring virtue, stucca, unity. So we have to do things proactive. An example, maybe once a week in your community, you alternate, you, you host the community in your house, refreshments, someone says a Dvar Torah, you give a little stucca, maybe a prayer together. And the next week someone else does it. There's so many ways to be proactive that not necessarily require a whole administrative um, and um, um, uh, uh, effort. You know, it could be done on, on small levels, at work, at home, in school. I mean, in schools we do see that children are encouraged to say extra Tehillim, and, and in general. So there are many groups that are, have grown out of this. I mean, I see the amount of Tehillim clubs there are, how much Tehillim is being said. It's, it's unbelievable. Now, it could always grow and there will always be more. So I think we have to find different ways. I personally, for example, this is what I do. I have a platform, thank God, a pretty big platform on YouTube and on the social media. So since the war has broken out, literally, I do, I've been doing, I probably did by now, probably 500, 600 programs. Literally, short ones, longer ones. That's my ability. Every one of us has the capacity, especially with, with the technology. What does it take to forward 
a, an email, an inspiring email, an inspiring story from the, from the soldiers on the front lines. Inspiring. Recently, I saw a story of a woman who's writing, her, she unfortunately lost her husband. You should see her, her strength, her, her courage, her, her in Yankiv, sharing a heartwarming story. And I know it's happening already. There's a lot of WhatsApp groups and others that keep doing this. But if you're asking, I would just be creative, find new ideas, or hook into something that's already happening. The most important thing is what we call in Hebrew and Yiddish, simas lev. You have to care. You have to care. There's no room for complacency and apathy or saying, me ani, umani, I'm a small nobody. I rely on the big rabbis and the teachers and the lecturers. No. All of us are here and, and blessed to be living in this time. And we have to show forever, including to our families and our children, that when there was a time of crisis, we were not complacent. We didn't retreat. We did something. We added more light into our lives. I think if we put our heads together, or even individually, each one of us, you talk to your spouse, you talk to your children, you talk to families, with friends, you come up and say, what, what, every week, maybe a new a little idea. I don't think there should be any reason that we can't keep on adding and adding and adding and adding. So I think that's the way. I don't, I think, and that accumulates. Is it going to be, I, we don't have to compete with our enemies in demonstrate. Every time they make a demonstration, we have to make a demonstration. We need to completely focus, and like I said before, Paula, your mom, and I, we are day workers. Bring, we have to create literally an unparalleled and unprecedented revolution of goodness and kindness and light like never before. The more demonic their hatred, the more powerful and passionate has to be our love and our mitzvahs. Okay, let's go to the next question. You're on. Shalom, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. Thank I'm you. having a very, very hard time uh, not being Hello? Connection was lost. And it, can you hear me? And now I can hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, um, okay. Um, I'm having a very, very hard time that the hostages have not you know, yet been released, um, the, you know, that they're suffering so much underground and all the abuse and how helpless they are. And um, I just wanted to know how, how, how do I relate to Hashem when it comes to this? I mean, you know, I feel uncomfortable and embarrassed to say that, you know, I, you know, I, I feel angry um, at him. I mean, I love him, but at the same time, I don't get it. I just don't understand it. Well, uh, welcome to the club, um, so to speak. We all don't understand it, just like we don't understand why what happened on Shminat Seris on October 7th happened, and we don't understand why the Holocaust happened. So I cannot sit here and defend and explain Hashem's ways. We don't understand but you have to remember this. What, even Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw Pare bathing, I mean, Rahman al Islam, he saw Pare bathing in the blood of Jewish children. Pare, Mitzrayim. So he pointed an accusing finger to Hashem and he said, Lomba Why are you doing evil to these people? He didn't blame Pare. He pointed to Hashem and says, you're allowing this to happen. I, I'm, I'm accusing you. And he was reprimanded for that. Hmm. Hashem reprimanded. And yet the Torah documents it. Wow. And then afterwards the Torah tells us that Hashem said, the, the patriarchs never challenged me like that. You're challenging me. And then he goes on, God, to reward him and said, I will reveal to you Shmi Havaya, the shame Hashem, the holy name of Yud Kei that I did not reveal to the others. Hmm. So my, my point is, Jews have always, um, always challenged Hashem. Faith does not mean that we just accept it laying down. We challenge. But remember, you don't want to bring it into an anger or into a bitterness that's demoralizing. We have to channel that anger into something positive. You know, when you hear, for example, Holocaust survivors speak and you ask them, don't you want revenge? 
against the Nazis. Don't you want, aren't you angry? And they say, absolutely. But you know what our revenge is? And they open up a photo album of their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. So I would say your anger is very legitimate. We all have anger. But I think what you want to do is to channel it into something positive. Or else then it just becomes something that's just demoralizing and is, uh, is not motivating. You right. want to be able to say, I'm angry? I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do double and triple of good. Now, I understand you can say, I want to get even with Hashem. Since he's allowed this to happen, why should I do another mitzvah? No. But that's not the way of the Jew. Mm -hmm. Faith means we're entitled to our feelings. We're entitled to be upset. But we don't allow our anger to define us. We don't allow even the evil to define us. We end up, as I always like to put it, we don't know why it happened, but we ask, what are we going to do about it? So you, and I say to you and whoever else is listening, we have responsibility to ourselves and our family and our children. Remember, how we behave is right. how our children will learn from us. What right. happened when we were angry? Did we just express anger or did we turn it into something positive? You know, if you're angry, you know, look, look at some of the, look at the soldiers in Israel. You can imagine how angry they are. Sure. They are at risk. They're literally risking their lives. And many of them have, unfortunately, their own colleagues look, have, have died in Al-Kiddush Hashem. But right. what do they do? They say, on the contrary, that it only motivates me the next morning. I'll wake up earlier and mm -hmm. I'm going to go out and we have to vanquish our enemy. In other words, we have to translate that anger into, harness it into a very positive, po powerful surge of positive effort. But it's still very painful. <laughs> I, it's, I, it's a I'm small not group that. I'm because not, I'm not, it's a select, I'm not, I'm, it's a select small group in Chas Shalom that it should not ever become more than that number. But yeah, I'm just, so listen, we pray for them. Um, we we hope that Hashem will protect them, and we hope that that Israel will do what it has to do to free them in every possible way. But at the same time, you have to remember that it's not. It's a, I'm not minimizing the hostages. The, the Jewish people have been attacked in general, and we have an enemy that's ready to do it again. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Here's, here's a question that somebody sent in. We discussed it a little bit. It says, Rabbi, nothing to do with the war. I just don't feel the meaning behind what we do now. Pesach coming up. And he's asking, what's, well, what am I missing? And can you please help me? What's the deeper meaning of every year of the mitzvahs? of remembering Mitzrayim, uh, basically how we can tap into the deeper meaning of the Yom Toivim and the Mitzvahs. I, I would ask the fellow whether he was here at the beginning of the program. I addressed that very directly. I can repeat what I said, but I would basically, everything is about personalizing the Yom Tov. If you want it to come alive in your personal life, you have to find in your life a Mitzrayim. I don't know if anyone in this world doesn't have some Mitzrayim in their lives. Mitzrayim can be your own psychological, personal blocks. It, it could be challenges you may have, Michelle and bias. It could be things that affect you and your children. It could be Parnosa, struggles in the in Daigasa, Parnosa, livelihood. It could be health issues. It could be with your parents. I mean, we live in a world, unfortunately, that's not a perfect world. So everybody has their Mitzrayim. If you want the Pesach to come alive, find and literally spell out on a piece of paper, what are the Mitzrayims of my life? And then look at all the mitzvahs and the Minhagim connected to the Seder as a blueprint for finding ways to free ourselves. You know, why do we eat matzah, for example? Matzah is the bread of lechem oini, it's the bread of humility. Because arrogance is one of the roots of most problems. Matzah is the antithesis to arrogance. Chometz is arrogance, and matzah is humility. So, so it's a way of looking at our own humility. Why do we do other, the other things in the, in, the, in the Haggadah? Each item, each step of the Haggadah is another step of finding personal Yesias Mitzrayim. So here not, may be the place or time to go into all the details, but I would recommend to this fellow or anyone interested if you go to my website, MeaningfulLife.com, and just write in the spiritual meaning of Passover or spiritual meaning of the Haggadah, you'll find uh, literally pages upon pages that go through every step of the Haggadah. I even have, I believe, a manual called 15 Steps Toward Personal Redemption. 
which is essentially lessons from Pesach for our personal growth. And the whole Seder you find to be is a fascinating blueprint, literally a blueprint, like an operator's manual of how you experience Mitzrayim and everything from Kaddish to uh, Nirsa, all the 15 steps, Kaddish, Urchatz, and so on. And uh, you know, take, for example, Magid. Magid means to tell the story, the whole Haggadah's name. Telling the story means breaking the silence, opening up, speaking to someone, speaking to your family, speaking to friends. So there's every step of that God is a tremendous psychological tool to experience some form of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim. And this is in general, including, of course, in our time, the challenges we have today. A step-by-step, -step, how to free yourself from all your problems. Absolutely. But it's work. Nothing is automatic. There are no magic tricks that I can tell you. It all takes work. Okay, let's go to the next live question, Rabbi Jacobson. Sure. The Elm is, the Elm is asking. The Elm is fragging. That's good. Yeah. Hi, how are you? You're muted. I can't hear you. Okay. I don't want her. her mic is not working. Let's try her. Wait a second. Hi, how are you? Hi, okay, good. Lord so Lord. I, okay, so here's I wanted to ask her about Jacobson. I read in the news today that huge amount of leftists are protesting at the, against Netanyahu in the streets of Tel Aviv. It got violent. And the Supreme Court of the Haredim must serve in the army starting Monday. The Haredim say, we refuse to serve and we really don't care that the average soldier has to extend his service because they simply don't have enough manpower. And here is my sinking feeling. If unity and octus is our strength, is the situation hopeless? I am really having trouble keeping hope alive. Yeshua is going to come because the minute the, the, like the most intense crisis is over, we're right back to where we were before this whole terrible thing happened. You're not asking me the question that I guess is the elephant in the room. Should we, should from Jews allow themselves to be drafted and join the army? It has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. Every segment of society is angry at another segment of society. I know I have my Mahatanister's cousin was supposed to be, um, was supposed to be let out of the army in May and now it just got extended for simple lack of of manpower so every side says i'm right and you're wrong every side exactly where we were before october 7th so it, it, it draft has nothing to do with it we have the leftists you know uh in the streets of tel aviv uh in kikar shabbat and they were in kikar shabbat really tremendous disunity that i thought would not come back after october 7th and if that's what we say is going to bring the issue, that's maybe maybe brought the down, the uh, Hamas attacking in the first place, and the incredible achdus afterwards, that's going to bring the issue. But I I'm just watching it all disintegrate so quickly. I'm having trouble that's, holding on to anything. No, I understand. Look, in life, um, since nothing is black and white, uh, there's some people who see it's partly cloudy, and some see say it's partly sunny, like the cup is half full, the half cup is half empty. I, I understand fully where you're coming from. At the end of the day, however, you can always see the bright side in things as well. On the other hand, you see an unprecedented unity, an unprecedented effort of people joining together, the support, financial support, moral support, other forms of support. So I am not suggesting all our problems are solved. You know, unfortunately, in Israel, before the war, there was plenty of divisiveness. I'm sure still behind the scenes or beneath the surface, there are politicians who unfortunately are not wise enough to understand there are times you have to get beyond your own political agendas. So there is plenty of things that can depress us, but there's also plenty of things that can, uh, that can give us hope and optimism. I like to feel that um, it's like um, that we have to always look at things with the right eye and try to focus on the positive. I'm not going to dismiss and, and, and minimize that possible, the fact that many people are not rising to the occasion, but many people are. 
So my answer to you is I think the key is to focus on the positive and be around people with the positive because it's just not an option. If you start getting involved in the negative possibilities and the negative, then it's like going to the bottom of the barrel. And yes, it could be very depressing and I don't see the benefit in it unless you can help change, change it. So it really comes down to looking at the positive. Look in life, you'll always see the people who made real change, who made positive change in life, did not not see the negative. They just did not accept no for an answer. They just did not allow the negative to bring them down. I'll give an example, a very, very secular example, and nothing to do with Judaism even. When the Wright brothers determined that they're going to create an airplane, an airplane that's going to fly in the sky, you can imagine how many naysayers said, it's ridiculous, it's impossible. There's gravity. You're going to bring, bring, bring. Imagine going to an investor and saying, I want $100 to invest. I'm going to create a ship that flies. And how much does the ship weigh? 100 tons or whatever it's going to be. Okay? You'd, you'd laugh them out of, the, out of your office. And yet, these two crazy guys, and I say it in a good way, did not take no for an answer, and they prevailed. The Jewish people are like this. When everyone said it's impossible, you have to give in, compromise, why don't you bow to Haman? No. There's a certain resolve that we absolutely believe. Does it mean that there aren't negative things? Of course there are plenty of reasons to make a case against it, but that's why we need to have the leadership quality of knowing we will prevail. So even though it is correct to say there are people who are, like I like to say, that are part of the problem, not part of the solution, you have to choose, and I have to choose, and we all have to choose to be part of the solution. And just because there's darkness, that doesn't mean we can't bring light in. Because if not, it's just going to bring you down. And Balatanya says already in Tanya, anything that demoralizes you, that does not motivate you to be better, is coming from the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah has many tricks up its sleeve. One of them is to say, look how dark it is. We can't do anything about it. There's always going to be divisiveness. There's the frum, the not frum, the chilanim. The chreidim, they'll never get along. That's not, we can't succumb to such an argument. We have to say, fine, there's darkness. I'm going to bring more light. I'll bring more Avis Yisrael. Invite more people. I always say this to my friends in Eretz Yisrael and everywhere. Imagine every Haredi, every Frumid invited a secular neighbor to Shabbos table. How the world would change. Now you'll say, some won't do it. Fine, they, they don't want to do it. Let them not do it. Let us do it. There's no excuse for the for us to to give in to the to the a depressing forecast, but rather we have to look at the positive and try to accentuate it and focus on it. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobs. Let's go to this question: the million dollar question. What does Hashem want from us after so many years of pain and more pain? We have been through so many different gulses and throughout this. And Mashiach is, should be here any day. However, it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, especially with all the pain we're experiencing. What does Hashem need from us to finally bring Mashiach? So two, two points I'll make. First of all, um, I can't speak for Hashem, and I'm not going to explain Hashem's ways. We don't understand many, many things that Hashem does. But I have to take issue to say nothing has changed that's very inappropriate. We speak about the Jewish people are here today. Is that not a miracle? Anyone that takes that for granted, to me, is being plain, plain, uh, plain uh, arrogant. The fact that we are sitting here and talking about this, the fact that we can send our children to any Jewish school we like, you can be as frum as you want, you're a Shemayim. It didn't exist. Unprecedented in history that we have such freedoms like we have today. So to say that there are no miracles and the Jewish people don't have, I mean, Shmuel says in the Gemara, the only difference in Mashiach and today is Shibit Malchi is being basically subjugated to the nations. What kind of Shibit Malchi do we really have? You know? So some people say we have to pay taxes and pay parking tickets. I understand. If our grandparents saw the Shibit Malchi we have compared to the Nazis, the Communists, the Cossacks, the Crusaders, the Inquisitions. So I'm not saying we're there yet. The Gula is not here yet. But to suggest that things have not changed to the better? That Avram Avinu Echad Avram 4,000 years ago, 
he pioneered Lasse's Dokar Mishpat, and he was only one man and one woman, Sarah, and that today over 4 billion people on the planet at least embrace and honor that those values. These are the most cherished values. You cannot say nothing has changed. Things have changed dramatically. It's not finished yet. And who needed this October 7th? And just like the Holocaust. I don't have an answer why there's still these setbacks, why there's still these moments you know, that, that we all would rather not happen. I don't have an answer for that. Why, what did Hashem need this for? I can't answer. After the fact, you could say it's a wake-up call. You could say maybe there's to, to remind us that we're united. I don't know. Maybe to remind us that we really have an enemy and don't get complacent. But, but I don't think we want to justify pain. We don't want to justify anything. So I, the attitude has to be not to look to Hashem, but to look to ourselves. I'm not worried about God. He will bring Mashiach, but he maybe wants us to do something. If you're a responsible adult, you don't say, oh, what does Hashem want? You don't say, what does that one want? You look at yourself, you're introspective, your soul search, and say, what are you going to do today and tomorrow and the next day that is going to bring Mashiach closer? How, how will you become a more loving, loving person? Are you going to be more refined, more giving, more compassionate, more sensitive, less obnoxious, less arrogant, less materialistic? We have plenty to look at in ourselves. So to just blame it all on God, yeah, it's a nice scapegoat. But at the end of the day, Hashem blessed us with Kaychis and said, I want you to do something. I sent you to this world that you should turn, turn this world into a home for me, a, a Mishkin for me, that you should help bring Mashiach. And Hashem promised us that he will meet us halfway or whatever it may be. Our espectana, our small effort, and Hashem will respond in kind. But to just sit and wait and say, what, why did Hashem do this? Why? That's not our shlichus. Our shlichus is to look at ourselves, how are we going to become better people? Here's a question somebody sent in. I live in Toronto and I'm very scared of what's going on. I'm scared to walk around as a Jew. What can I do? And what is the global lesson we should take out from what's going on in the world with all the anti-Semitism? Well, So what do we say? We say every day in davening, eights of a sufar, right? And we speak about and pachat pisem. In other words, the, the antidote to fear is faith, is to know Hashem runs the world. And this is true not only in uh, regarding the events of our time right now. There are many people who are afraid of, of marriage, of commitment. There are many people afraid of uh, traumas in their lives. They go to therapy for this. Ultimately, the answer to all fear is to find deeper strengths and know that Hashem is blessing you with life, gives you a neshama, and gives you all the strength you need to overcome any challenge. And so I'm not, I understand that there's fear, but, that, but, but our response to fear has always been connecting to something higher. Like the expression from Rabbi Meir Meprimishlan, he said, I'm a sugibun eben faltmanishtunten. When you're bound above, you don't fall below. It's connecting to thing to, to a faith, to a betachen and trust in Hashem that's stronger than us. And, and, when, and when, when you stand, feel strong that Hashem is with you, it allows you that a person should not have fear and not, have, and not be scared and not be frightened. Um, is it human to be frightened? It is. That's when we dig deeper and we have to connect to something greater and higher. Like one person who was a terrorist victim told me, they, they were they were very well very 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 big casualties and wounds that they incurred from a terrorist attack years ago. So she told me once, you don't know how strong a muna and betochen is until you have nothing left but a muna and betochen. So thank God we're blessed also with other faculties. But this is where the challenge comes. I mean, I've been using the expression. I think it's borrowing it from another context that Jewish people are like a tea bag. You don't know how strong they are until you put them into hot water. So for some people, when they go into hot water, they yell, it's hot. And for a Jew, the way to go is, oh, it's hot. So it brings out even deeper strengths within us. And that has to be our attitude. And uh, I would also suggest speaking to people who have a moon and betachen that give you strength. Very easy to be afraid when you're all alone. You have, to, you have to connect with others, join with others, and do it like a group. Or groups tend to become stronger. So if a soldier... On the front lines, afraid, but he has a he's together with a whole troop, with a whole, with a whole group of different soldiers that all they each strengthen each other. So we need each other as well 
in this process. Valdek, Valdek. Okay, let's let's go to this question. Very interesting question. My family goes every year to hotels for Pesach and it's luxuries, but now I feel a little guilty going away for Pesach with everything going on. I can't just go. It's, it's the things we do. Can you help me feel not guilty? Basically, this is what we do. We go, we live the luxurious life, and now with everything going on, they feel guilty living this life when people are suffering and people are you know losing their lives. So what should be their mind? They're going. They just want to know what the mindset should be. It's a very good question. And it's also in general, people have asked me, a lot of people who, want, who go on vacations and they're going to resorts, not just Pesach, is it appropriate when there's a war? So generally speaking, I would say when there's a war for, being fought of your own brothers and sisters, you don't just escape somewhere uh, for, for your own leisure. The only justification to go to Pesach at a resort, in my opinion, and I'll say it bluntly, is if you use the opportunity of Pesach not just to sit and indulge in every type of food and, and the swimming pool and all the other delights that come with resorts. It's to use the opportunity to maybe bring, bring Pesach to more Jews. So maybe you should consider um, participating at the program in teaching a class, in reaching out to other people, not just indulge. I've been to many Pesach programs. I go as a lecturer, as a speaker. So I see people just create their own little, their, their own little minion sometimes, their own little group, and they just uh, basically take care of themselves. I would recommend, especially this year, I would recommend it all the time, is, is call Yisrael Adevim Zebezeh. Why not get to know other people, not for business connections and networking, on a Yiddishkeit level? Why not come out of your little cubicle or your well, little cocoon? They can invite me for Pesach. That's another way, yeah, okay. I'm sure a lot of people would love to be invited. But in case you feel you can't afford it or whatever the reason is, but why, why lock ourselves up and we'll use an opportunity to create more Avis Yisrael and Ahdus Yisrael. And if you're feeling guilty, uh, guilty enough, so I'm not going to tell you not to go, but you have to use it to really say, Tashem, I went, but I went for, for, I had a purpose I went for. I didn't just go to take care of myself and my family, which in general is not a Jewish approach. We, you know, Think about what would Avram Avinu do if he ended up at a Pesach resort? What would Moshe Rabbeinu do? They wouldn't just sit around and 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 compare notes of of what, whether lunch or dinner or the barbecue, you know, running from one meal to the next. I'm quite familiar with the whole uh, system, so they would be busy all the time finding ways to memorize and inspire and to strengthen Eden in every possible way. And yes, if you can invite someone along that 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 can use it, maybe you give someone such a gift. So I would definitely look at it that way, and that would justify, in my opinion, the only way. Without that, it would be like the equivalent of somebody Hashem blessed him with a lot of money. And instead of using the money to help people, he just sits on the money all day, busy with his investments, his own, his own self for glorification. No, you're blessed with money. You're mechuyiv to give tzedakah. Hashem gave you a gift. He trusted you as a pekodin. Like David HaMelech said to Hashem, why did you create rich people and poor people? Why not everyone... Equal. It says, Leah Kesev Leah Azov. Why don't you give everyone equal? And Hashem said, Chesed them is my Yitzarua. If I don't, if I give everyone equally, who's going to do Chesed? So the only reason Svarim say we're given more of anything, whether it's the ability to go to a resort, to a resort, whether it's more money, whether it's more wisdom, whether it's whatever blessing we have, is Hashem says, I'm trusting you as a Pukodin to watch over it. It's not for you, it's not yours. I'm giving it to you as a blessing so you should share with others. So if you go with that attitude and you see an opportunity today, that has to be the approach. Unfortunately, there's the concept of Yishman Yishudin Vayivat. As Yishudin, as Eden become more, uh, Yishman means literally heavier. They become more indulgent. And Vayivat, they begin to become, it's all about me, me, me. That's what success can do. Success can create this, uh, this uh, illusion of Keshi Ve'etzim Yodi Osli Sakhail Azeh that I'm a self-made man and I don't need anything and anyone. And it should be the exact opposite. You have the opportunity to go to a Pesach program. Use it to, in a humble way and teach your children, not just that we are special, we have the ability, we're going to do whatever possible to invite Eden. I'll give you an example. I was at a resort and it was, it was obviously all taken over completely by the Pesach program. But, you know, people traveled through there and I suggested at one of my talks, I said, you're going to go tomorrow Cholamid, with your children to... Uh, the waterfall that was there to amusement park. Why don't you look around for Yidin and invite them to a meal? 
Let them know what Pesach is. Maybe they don't even know what Pesach is. A few people started laughing. They thought it was a ridiculous idea. They thought, what are you talking about? I said, no, you, maybe that's why you came for this Pesach Seder. Not just to take care of yourself. And to their credit, quite a few people did that. And I remember that night by dinner, quite a few people who, secular people from the community, came to a Pesach meal. And they tasted Pesach for the first time. They tasted matzah. That's an example. There could be other examples, but you have to see everything as an opportunity. Hashem blessed you that you can go to such a resort. Show Hashem that you're not going just to indulge for yourself. Like the expression, not be a tzaddik in pelts. A tzaddik in pelts means a tzaddik who wears a fur coat to keep himself warm, but rather to light a, a fireplace so everybody gets warm, not just you. What would be a good uh, filo? Something that we could say every day for the matzah to help us connect. Well, David HaMelech already gave us a Sefer Tehillim. And there's different kapitlach that people have pointed out that are really very direct, whether it's kapitl chof, kapitl kuf chof alef, uh, uh, the kapitl chof gimel. I mean, there are quite a few chat. I mean, I would, I would, we don't have to create new tefillahs. You know, there's the tefillahs that are said in times of, of tzara or in time when we need special help. Um, Havayali Ba'ezi and different psukim and so on. So, I, I mean, I would that I'd recommend to talk to your local rov or someone that knows where you are and your matzav. I mean, there's the, the kapitlach out there that are very fitting. I, I mentioned a few of them. We want to ask that question? I'm sure not all questions were answered. Not the last question over there, Kevin. Ah. Well, look, let me put it this way. Even if, it, if, if people want to ask questions afterwards, I'm pretty accessible. You can easily send a question to you. You can forward it to me. I'd be happy to answer it online or, uh, or via WhatsApp or any group that you make. And uh, don't see this as a lost opportunity. I mean, whatever we can get through here, we can, but there's always more questions. I actually do a program every Sunday night, which I did before this program. It's called My Life, Chassidah Supplied, where I answer questions people send in every week. You can check that out, chassidahsupplied.com. We could post any question you like. Just uh... Okay, so just the last question. I'm home for Pesach. I've gone through a lot, a lot of situations. My siblings, my kids, my kids are not coming for Yom Tovim. And this is a feeling that I have. Basically, he writes, the being stabbed in my back. I guess there's a lot of complications here. How can I understand what Hashem wants from me going through these challenges? Look, whenever you hear a situation where family doesn't want to come, you really, I can imagine there's more uh, to the story. And uh, I'm not, I obviously cannot comment because I don't know what the story is case by case. I don't know, you know, it usually takes two to tango, which means you have to look at all sides of it. Uh, if you really care about this, I think in all, you, in, in the full humility, you may have to sit down with your children, maybe not, not before Pesach, because there may not be time for it, but in a sincere way, try to create reconciliation and try to find a third party, a mediator, that will listen. You know, I, I, I deal with this a lot, and very often children feel very alienated, feel hurt. Uh, children who tell me, adult children with their own families, my parents just won't listen. My parents always think they're right. And, uh, and, I'm not, some cases that may be true. Some cases the children may be part of the problem. Sometimes at both sides. So I, I am a firm belief that if a person goes with MS and is looking for the MS, not to be right and not out of insecurity, just try to justify themselves and blame everyone else. And if you get narcissism and other self-interest out of the picture, you can reconcile and re resolve most issues. But you have to be ready for that. To just say, hey, my children are not coming to me, have Rahmanas on me, I'd like to know why. Maybe they have a very legitimate reason. Am I defending them? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're maybe they don't have a good reason. I, it's hard to say, answer that question. I do know that when they smoke this fire, and you have to look into it. Like why, why children naturally 
love their parents. Parents naturally love their children. So if there's some type of rift or uh, some form of uh, disconnect, there, there must be something that caused it. Now, it's easy to point fingers. Everyone blames each other. But in the spirit of true emes and true Avis Yisrael and Shalom Bayis and so on, you have to look into it. I mean, this is also true about spouses. You know, I just was dealing with a couple that unfortunately are not getting along. And this pace out, they decided they're going to do separate Zadarim. And, and one night the children will go to one. They're not divorced, but it's, uh, so I'm trying to suggest to them maybe we can find the reason. But I see it's a lot more complicated. It didn't start now. A lot of these problems are, are deeply entrenched. And it was not nipped in the bud, so things have grown out of proportion. And there's all kinds of factors involved. Sometimes it's money factors. I mean, to talk about Pesach programs, I've seen Pesach programs where I, in the middle of Pesach, ended up becoming a, uh, a mediator of families, where the family, everyone feels my, my, my parents, who are very wealthy, are playing favoritism. They gave more money and more support. They gave an extra room to my brother and not to me when I needed it, etc. There's many, many things that cause rifts and cause jealousies, and it's very hard to enumerate them all. It's case by case. If you're sincere and you want to really resolve issues, find a mediator. Find a mashpia, a mentor, a therapist, a rov, someone that has common sense, someone you trust, some, someone that both parties trust, and try to, try to start unraveling this situation. But you're going to have to be ready to know that you are not always 100% right, no matter how convinced you are that you are. That's the only way that things start making shifting. Thank you, Walter. Let's go to the closing now. Shkareh Rebbe Jacobson. First of all, good to Shkareh Rebbe Jacobson. Simon Jacobs is coming on tonight. Tremendous chizik. We really spoke to a lot. There was a lot of questions. Jordan got a lot of chizik, a lot of inspiration. And Mat Shem, Rebbe Jacobs will come back again, Mat Shem down the road, and give more chizik again tonight. next year. He's 180. Again, if anyone wants to join the WhatsApp chats, please WhatsApp me at 732-314-1710. Um, Menachem will also put on the email um, the link to join the community chats that we post to Shiurim. Go to MenachemBernfeld.com and sign up for the weekly emails as well. If again, anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30, this is Zoom ID. We have different important topics. Please spread the word on the show next week. We're going to have Rev. David Goldwasser. We're getting ready for the topic of Pesach, how to deal with Pesach this year. Uh, it should be a deep and meaningful program. Please join, let people know about it. Everything will be recorded at Shem. It'll be on Menachem Bernfeld. Dot com's website. If anybody has any questions, you can email Coach at gmail.com. Also, be a on Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Simon Jacobson's website. We'll send them the information. Again, um, if anybody has any questions, email Coach at gmail.com. If anybody wants to, oh, also the phone number to hear the Shir Matshem tomorrow is 732 305 9011. 732 305 9011. If anybody wants to be in touch with Rabbi Jacobson or his whole program and his little Shirim, you can go to meaningfullife.com. That's his website. And again, thank you to all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Ellie Nariel for Five Town Central, Chayla Kalfa from JCN. We'll go to Coach Menachem for closing. I just want to say Rabbi Jacobson for coming on. I feel like we spoke through a lot of important topics, things that are bothering people, things on people's mind, and that's why we're here tonight. We're here every Sunday night, really, to Red, red Dark and Yonim and have a Sikh Sarem to really speak to people, and people should you know, be vocal, and we should really address people's things. And this is what we're doing. This is our, instead of our protesting, this is the way we protest. We, we come together and we give each other chizik and we give us a, a drachah and we try to really, we could stand in the streets probably screaming, yelling for rocks, but this is probably a little bit more uh, tachazdik. So shkrech for coming on, Coach Menachem and then Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Jacobson. Like we heard, Baruch Hashem, a lot of, a lot of uh, chizik. Um, just to sum it up, I believe we're in a massive where Hashem is uh, shaking us up and we were hoping that this is part of the Gula and we have we have all of these questions and this is the time before Pesach to connect, to gain our emunah and betachen and that's why we have many questions and there are no answers. We don't know the answers and that's where emunah comes in. Hashem runs the world. We try to understand we're sitting here and trying to figure out why this, why that, but there are some things that we just can't understand, and that's where the Amunah B'tachim comes in. So I think this is the right time now before Pesach to sit down and look, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What, where is my connection with Hashem? How can I get better like we heard? And all of that, so Amit Hashem. Like, like every time, we should be able to take out what works for us, everyone, individualize and globalize 
everything we heard in Mitzvah Shem. Jacobson, almost two hours. Tell me, leave the oil with a different chizik. It's a good word, a good story. First of all, thank you again for having me. It is very auspicious times. Mismach Gula as we move from Adar into Nissan. Um, uh, talking about uh, Amunah and Betachen, there's a, there's a, uh, a powerful story um, with, I think it was the Blazhen Rebbe, who was uh, unfortunately in the concentration camps, and with some of his chassidim. And uh, in this particular camp, you know, each of them had their own, this Nazis, Yamach Shemom, had their own sadistic cruelty. And in this particular camp, the commander, the Nazi commander, had this, had this uh, pleasure, this sadistic pleasure of torturing the Yidden by playing a game, quote-unquote. He would have the Yidden line up and dig these very deep trenches, these very wide trenches. And then they would start playing music as they usually did, which was even more to just to drive the pain further. They play music. And the game began that any Jew that jumps over the trench and makes it over the wide trench lives. Anyone who doesn't gets shot on the spot. And then they be, so they began, the game began, quote unquote, and in the havoc and the mayhem, nobody knew who survived or didn't survive. Before they started, one of the chassidim says to the Rebbe, he says to him, Rebbe, let's already let ourselves die, let ourselves be shot. How, how much riffle is ashir? How much can we already tolerate? Not just being tortured, dehumanization. Let's just let our neshamas go back to our makers and be at peace. And the Blazhen Rebbe said to him, no, as long as Hashem gives us some strength, we have to always hold on, even to our last breath. And then this game began. As I said, in the mayhem, nobody knew who survived. A few weeks later, the camps were liberated. And lo and behold, the Rebbe and the Chosid reunite. And the Chosid says to the Rebbe, he says, I, I, what happened? You're not a young man. How did you jump over the trench? So he said, when they started, I closed my eyes and I held on to the capote, to the coattails of my holy father and my holy grandfather, my holy great-grandfather, and gave me the strength to jump. And the, the Rebbe says to the Chassid, he said, what about you? You're also not a young man. How did you jump? So he said, I held on to your coattails. I held on to your kapot. The power of Amunah and Betochen is not that people think as some type of desperate act or crutch. It's, act, it's not just the absence of reason. As much as Seichel can lead us somewhere, it only leads us to a door that only real Amunah and Betochen can carry. Amunah and Betochen is this super rational dedication and confidence then no matter what happens, I will prevail. What the Yidin always had, not because they felt they were so powerful, but because Hashem is powerful. And when I hold on to his coattails, and I hold on to the generations before us, to the mission that he like says, Nona Salgaba Nok, we're like midgets that stand on the shoulders of giants. That gives us a strength to see even farther than the giant himself can see. And that is something that is our enemies never were able to fight. Because how do you fight Amunah? What weapon can extinguish Amunah? How they thought that the men, the powerful men with their weapons may be a threat to him. So when he heard from his stargazers that a Moshe Rabbeinu, a man will rise and take the Eden out of Mitzrayim, he said, Let me, let's kill all the boys. They'll throw him into the river Nile. The men said, the Jewish men said to their wives, let's not have children as long as this decree happens because he's going to kill all the boys. The woman said, no, 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 no. Amunah, b'schus amunah, b'schus noshim sitkonius nigla v'senim v'tzayim, because the woman said, no, if we don't have children, how, who's ever going to leave this God-forsaken place? And Hashem made a promise to Avram Yitzhak Yankim and Sarah Rivka Rachelei, where we will free, be freed from Israel. And and talking, many many children were killed. Rahman al-Islam. 
And yet, some of the women went, the Gemara says in Seita, went to the fields and they gave birth. And of course, Yecheved, the Moshe, she put him in a, in, a, uh, in a waterproof basket on the River Nile. And he was the man that, that was the most important of all. In other words, it's a Muna. And so Pare and all anti-Semites, they thought, who's our enemy? They thought on their terms, who's the most powerful? The one with the greatest weapons. The men are stronger than the women. Women and children could be subdued. But they never could fight a Muna because they didn't understand its power. Like Just like Haman could not fight a Muna. So we have to understand that Amunah is a secret weapon, the most powerful of them all. This doesn't take away using our wits and our intelligence and planning and strategizing. You still lock your doors and you, you have strong armies, but we have the additional power that we know we're tied above, which allows us to forge ahead and never fall below. So this is a time, it says, Pesach cultivates Amunah. Even it says, Michle de Memnusa. That matzah is called bread of faith. The very bread itself. It's the bread of amunah. So it feeds our amunah. It strengthens our amunah. It's a time to focus on that power. And we teach this to our children. And again, the proof is in the pudding. Look at the thousands of years of all the oppression, all the mitzrayims, and here we are. We need proof that amunah has that type of indestructible strength. So everyone should have say, Koshen Frelch and Pesach is 30 days before Pesach. And move from Misma Gula to Gula and to the Gula Amitis Vashlema, complete Gula. And there's no question that this is all a shlav, a stage, a step to reaching, to crossing that threshold. May it happen now. So Bamela Lashana Bobi Rishalayim will be automatically in Rishalayim. Amen. Amen. Shkarek Rabbi Jacobson, really appreciate it. Everybody have a wonderful night. We'll see you next time, next week. Same time, same place. Good night. Good night. Thank you.